Hello, and welcome to Mazar's Tax Tips, a podcast series where we will discuss some quick tips to keep in mind this tax season. I'm your host, Rachel Ephthemis, a senior tax manager at Mazar's in the U.S., and I'm joined today by my colleagues Harold Hecht, a managing director and practice leader in our state and local tax practice, and David Weinstock, a principal at Mazar's USA Wealth Advisors. Mazar's in the U.S. is an independent member firm of Mazar's Global, an international audit tax and advisory firm with operations in over 90 countries. And we are committed to helping our clients and people succeed by respecting who they are and how they work and adapting our approach accordingly. Today's tax systems pose significant challenges for both businesses and individuals. The complexities of domestic and international rules mean taxpayers need clear and informed guidance. Tune in to this podcast series to learn more about what the Mazars Tax Group has to offer. David, let's talk a little bit about IRAs. Can contributions now be made to IRAs after you turn age 70 and a half? Okay, so there's something new. Uh, yes, in fact, the SECURE Act, effective January 1st, 2020, changed that. Um, widely known provisions of the SECURE Act included pushing back the year that you must begin taking required minimum distributions from 70 and a half to 72, and then there was a highly publicized death of the stretch IRA, where a beneficiary can continue to, or could continue to defer taxes by taking distributions over their own life expectancy after the original IRA owner died. Can't do that anymore. But a lesser known provision eliminated the 70 and a half age restriction to make deductible contributions to an IRA. So individuals can now continue contributing to an IRA even after required minimum distributions must begin, which again, is now age 72. Interesting. All right. So who can make these contributions? Uh, just about anybody. Uh, to contribute, you have to have earned income. And even those without earned income can have a spouse contribute to their IRA if the spouse has earned income greater than the contributions. Okay. But are there still limits? Okay, well, it's as if we rehearsed this because, in fact, yes, <laughs> um, the same income limitations to making deductible contributions still apply. That have always applied. Um, if you're covered by a qualified retirement plan at work, there is no deduction for a single person with, a, with income over $76,000. There's no deduction for a married person. Um, if they are the one that's covered by an employer plan earning and the married couples earning over 125, that limit is 208,000 of income for the individual who is not covered by a retirement plan at work. And the same limits to making Roth contributions apply still after the change. Generally, incomes over $140,000 if you're single, no Roth contribution. And the same applies for uh, $208,000 of income for, for joint couples. So should people do this if they're eligible? Well, generally, tax sheltered investments are a good idea. But the greatest benefit comes from compounding over time. The deductible contribution reduces taxes, and earnings aren't taxed until distributions are taken. Contributions made late in life and closer to taking distributions benefit less from tax-deferred compounding, so the tax benefits will be modest. Roth IRAs may be better for older clients who won't need the money, which is common if they're thinking of contributing late in life. Um, there are no RMDs uh, for a Roth IRA, so compounding can be longer. Okay, and are there any options for people who are earning over the income limits? Well, this is where maybe we can get a little bit more creative. Yes, there are. Um, I think obvious to a lot of people, if they are still working, they can contribute to a 401k or similar plan if available at work. But they can also make non-deductible IRA contributions if they're over the income limits and then do a backdoor Roth contribution some people have heard about. Okay, can, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, for many, it probably requires that. Um, it's perhaps an unintended combination of laws that allows this. There's an income limit on direct Roth contributions, but since 2010, there is no income limit 
to Roth conversions. And there's no income limit to make a non-deductible IRA contribution. Combined, this allows people who earn too much to make a Roth contribution to make non-deductible IRA contributions and then turn right around and convert them to a Roth IRA without tax. Only if, and this is the warning, only if they don't have other pre-tax IRAs. Since 2017, Congress favorably recognized that this was a legal maneuver. Okay, interesting. Good to know. Is there anything else that our listeners need to know about making contributions after age 72? Well, yes, in fact, for some. Um, Those who are charitably inclined and plan to take advantage of the IRA qualified charitable distribution should not make deductible IRA contributions after age 70 and a half. That's important to remember. Okay, really, why is that? Well, the IRS sees this as double dipping and they have set forth a complicated formula which really boils down to the fact that they are going to track your deductible IRA contributions made made after age 70 and a half, only those made after age 70 and a half, And they will use those in the future to offset the tax benefits of future qualified charitable distributions. You don't want to combine those two. Okay. And why are qualified charitable distributions valuable? Yeah, well, you know what? It's the point that they're valuable that might lead people to think to do this. The qualified charitable distribution is great planning for those who will make charitable contributions anyway. And have to take RMDs or required minimum distributions. It allows IRA owners aged 70 and a half or older, that age didn't change in the new law, in the new law under the Secure Act. It allows those people to transfer IRA distributions up to $100,000 a year or $200,000 for a married couple, each of them making a charitable contribution from their IRA directly to charity, tax-free, and count them also towards satisfying their required minimum distribution. This provides a tax benefit, even if they're using the standard deduction, and does not increase adjusted gross income, which might cause the loss of other tax breaks or benefits. It's an efficient way to get the, to get the job done. I see. Good. Yeah, that's a great tip. It actually brings up a good point about timing your 2021 charitable donations to receive the most favorable tax treatment because President Biden has proposed a couple changes that could actually limit itemized deductions. Under Biden's proposals for taxpayers earning more than $400,000 a year, he wants to reinstate the P's limitation, which was eliminated a few years ago back in 2017 by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And this P's limitation reduces a taxpayer's total itemized deductions by 3%. This P's limitation is actually already set to expire in 2025, but he just wants to accelerate that. Um, And in addition, he has proposed capping the benefit of total itemized deductions at a 28% rate. So for example, for taxpayers in a tax bracket over 28%, their income would be taxed at the higher rate. However, they would only receive a maximum benefit of their itemized deductions at a 28% rate, which is going to ultimately result in a tax increase. So if you're thinking about making charitable contributions this year, it may be a good idea to make them sooner rather than later, since the deduction might be limited based on these proposals as of the date of enactment, if these laws actually are uh, put into place. So Harold, switching gears here, what are some of the state tax issues that have arisen for individual taxpayers as a result of the pandemic? Well, first and foremost, Uh, There's been a lot of issues surrounding residency. Rachel, you and I have spoken to many clients that left population centers such as New York City for most of 2020. And there's really a common misconception out there that if a person was absent for most of the year that automatically that means they're no longer a resident in that case of New York City. And, And many people focus on something called 183 day rule Uh, which is not always controlling. Actually, this is 
probably one of the most complex areas where it comes to personal income taxation because the residency rules differ in many states and each circumstance can really be extremely fact specific. In fact, we've even seen circumstances where an individual can be a resident in more than one state, which is clearly not a great answer. In addition to residency, one of the other issues that uh, has been very prevalent is concerning the sourcing of salary and wages for remote workers. So what are some of these issues concerning the, the state sourcing of wages? The issue is that income uh, in the form of salary or wages may or may not be sourced to the normal workplace and withholding may or may not have been made to the appropriate state. Again, the rules are pretty confusing. Um, some of the states came out with specific rules covering uh, the pandemic, which said that uh, normal withholding should take place. Uh, other states did not change those rules. So effectively, this is really both for employers and employees, a somewhat confusing uh, set of rules. And compounding that is depending on the state rules, salary income could actually, believe it or not, be taxed by two states without a credit allowed for the tax paid in the other state. I see. You know, we've also seen in the news that New Hampshire is suing Massachusetts. And we hear a lot about New York's convenience of the employer rules. Can you just explain what, what this is all about? Sure. Uh, so firstly, uh, Massachusetts instituted a law specific to the pandemic, which enables Massachusetts to tax uh, individuals who resided who reside in New Hampshire but were working in Massachusetts prior to the pandemic but are now working remotely. Uh, so the law would allow Massachusetts to continue to tax these New Hampshire residents as if they were working in Massachusetts. This is a, a, a particularly egregious rule from the point of view of New Hampshire residents because there's no personal income tax in New Hampshire. Currently, Rachel, uh, that lawsuit is uh, been brought to the US Supreme Court and we're all waiting to see if certiorari is granted and the court decides to hear that case. Uh, New York and a handful of other states also apply what is oddly called a convenience of employer rule and that that rule specifically says that uh, in the event that someone is telecommuting and that work is being performed from home, that generally speaking, uh, that is deemed to be for the individual's convenience, not necessity, and therefore uh, the salary and wages earned during that telecommuting period uh, revert back uh, to the state that the person normally works in. So as an example, if an individual is assigned to a New York office of an employer and is working remotely in New Jersey uh, and they're working from home, New York says that the convenience of employer rule uh, applies and that that salary is basically taxed by New York and employers are required to withhold New York tax. Uh, and, and furthermore, New York has actually come out and said, even during the pandemic, that they are going to enforce this particular rule. I guess lastly, uh, just introduced was a bipartisan bill in the US Senate that would prevent states from applying these convenience type rules. But of course, remains to be seen whether Congress actually takes any action with respect to that particular uh, rule. Thank you, Harold. Yeah, very, very interesting stuff and very tricky and especially relevant, like you said, now with the pandemic and a lot of people working remotely for this past year. Well, I really want to thank you both, Harold and David, for your very helpful insights. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today. Please note all information that was shared on this podcast extends from reputable sources and the views expressed today are meant to serve as suggested guidance based on knowledge and experience. 
If you would like more information about the topics discussed today and other helpful tips, please visit us at blog.mazars.us backslash tax tips one. Thank you and have a great day.